Hi, I'm Bill Turkell. I'm a professor of history at the University of Western Ontario in Canada. Today I'm going to talk about my experiences using Mathematica for text and image mining in my own research. I want to say a little bit about the differences between humanities research and research in science and technology. Humanities research is conducted under very different conditions than the STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. I want to explain why Mathematica is a wonderful programming environment for humanists or for people working in the humanities. And I'm going to talk about teaching the techniques that I use to students who have very little or no background in technical material. Scholarship in the humanities, including history, differs from science and, enge and engineering along a number of dimensions. First, there's a focus on close reading and interpretation of sources. These include things like texts, images, artifacts, and media. Second, there's an expectation that humanities researchers will often work, in, work alone. In fact, sometimes they always work alone. Third, humanists are trained in ways that rarely include much background in math or computation. And finally, humanists typically receive much less in the way of research funding, which changes the way that they do projects in groups of larger than one or two people. If humanities researchers are going to use powerful computational tools in their own research, tailored to their own research, typically they have to develop those tools on their own. Here I'm going to start by describing a number of examples of small research projects where the coding was either all done by one person, namely me, or all done by a few people, including me. The first project that I'll mention was one of the largest that I've been involved with. Over a number of years, research teams that I was on relating to this project included between two people and about 12 people at a time. In the humanities, when humanists think of a large project, this is typically the kind of thing that they're thinking of, no more than, say, a dozen people. The Old Bailey Online is a fully searchable edition of all of the criminal trials that were held at London's Central Criminal Court between 1674 and 1913. It is, quote, the largest body of texts detailing the lives of non-elite people ever published. I didn't have anything to do with creating this resource that was done by other teams of researchers. But between 2010 and 2013, I wrote about 70 odd Mathematica notebooks to mine the text of the Old Bailey online. Now the fact that Mathematica notebooks support what Knuth called literate programming makes them an excellent way to communicate technical ideas to colleagues who have less background in technical materials. Obviously, they're specialists in the uh, subject matter. The figure that you see in this slide shows the length of a criminal trial in words on the y-axis plotted against the date of the trial on the x-axis. The murders in this uh, archive are depicted with a red, drop, red, red dot, and all of the other trials are depicted with a a uh, lighter, more translucent gray dot. And in fact, most of the trials in the archive, the majority of the trials in this archive are actually thefts. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this graph, if you just kind of squint at it, is you'll notice that the trial length starts to bifurcate in the 1800s, with some trials being less than about 100 words in length, and some of them more than a couple of hundred words in length, but they're relatively few in between. So there's a split in trial length. Now this pattern of behavior persists over more than 50 years. And until we plotted the uh, data in this form, no one had actually noticed that it was there or had observed that it was there. And it reflects a number of factors, but among other things, it reflects the rise of plea bargaining in the 19th century and the rise of the guilty plea. Let me turn to a project that's just getting started. And this is one that's more typical of my research collaborations. I'm working with one other person, Amy Bell, and she's an expert on mid 20th century British cultural history. She's an expert on the subject matter, the time and the place, and I'm handling the programming and the methods more generally for our project. Our practice as we work together is kind of like the agile 
uh, development technique of pair programming. So we can sit down and share, now virtually of course, but we can sit down and share a screen with a Mathematica notebook, and we can use computational techniques to explore our sources. We can document our thinking in the notebook. We can write down our questions, our interpretations, ideas, as we work. So in other words, Mathematica notebooks, a shared notebook, allows us to have a computationally augmented conversation about sources and interpretation. The subject of our research in this case is the Mass Observation Project. In 1937, the Mass Observation Organization began recruiting hundreds of volunteers to write diaries and to answer questionnaires. And they also paid investigators to do things like go into public situations and just write down people's conversations and descriptions of their behaviors. And the goal of the project was to better understand the lives of ordinary Britons. And this project resulted in an extensive archive of the daily life and culture of mid 20th century Britain. For this work, as I say, we're just getting started. We're working with a uh, method called distributional concept analysis, which was developed by Peter Dabola and his colleagues. And whereas many text analysis methods uh, rely on n-gram windows that are centered on a word of interest, the DCA method is interesting because it relies on small n-gram windows that are positioned some distance before and after the word of interest. Something like DCA is, is relatively easy to implement. I think it took probably a couple of days to get the code in working order so that we could begin to start exploring this text with these, this particular technique. Another project that I worked on for many years that involved text and image mining was conducted with a former student of mine. He and I applied a number of techniques to the subject of stage magic in the late 19th and early, early 20th century. And what we were trying to do is we we're trying to develop a kind of an experimental approach to history. So we use techniques like desktop fabrication and physical computing. Unfortunately, this was before Mathematica had uh, good support for 3D printers and microcontrollers, so a lot of that work wasn't done in Mathematica. But we also did a lot of text and image mining. We had a fairly large collection of periodicals, books, and in a number of cases, entire runs of magic magazines. And part of the work involved automatically and extracting images from those page images, and then identifying the things in them, people, apparatus, card tricks, and so on. The picture here from that project shows some of the now problematic Orientalist costumes that magicians of the time preferred to wear. Here's another example. Let me just start this running. Here's another example of uh, images from that same work. There's a collection at the University of Manitoba that contains seance photography from the early 20th century. And some of these images are actually stereoscop stereoscopic pairs. With a few lines of code, it's possible to create a wobble image that alternates left and right frames rapidly. And in this case, I actually put the code in the presentation notebook, but I'm happy to provide code for other examples if you contact me. Another collaborative project that I've been working on for a number of years also involves text and image mining. For this project, I started by using Mathematica to write crawlers to compile an archive of millions of pages of text from the open web. And the kind of thing that I was collecting were texts that relate to the histories of electronics, of computation, and of scientific instrumentation. One focus of this work has been developing tools that can understand circuit diagrams. These images show the automated labeling of components in a circuit image. So this image was extracted automatically from the surrounding text. And then we then go through and use uh, machine vision techniques and that kind of thing to automatically label and identify components. Underneath the labeled schematic, you can see the network that shows the the um, ways that those components are connected to one another. And our ultimate aim in this work is to develop a system that can identify meaningful assemblies of components, meaning, meaningful design idioms, if you will, that occur in schematics above the level of individual components. So when we think about 
being able to do semantic search for the history of electronics, we want to be able to search for design idioms, things like a Wheatstone bridge, for example, and not for just to be able to search for a particular resistor, a particular capacitor, which isn't nearly as useful. As a final example, I'll mention another project in the history of engineering that we just started. My collaborator here is a retired professor of civil engineering. We're creating a large database of historical bridge images with a lot of metadata. We have about 4,000 images right now, but the number is growing daily. And we're combining these records in our database with linked open data via Mathematica's new support for Sparkle queries and we're developing a machine vision system to go along with it. The idea is to be able to create a system that can look at historical bridge images and can extract features that are of interest in the history of civil engineering. Now, as a historian of electronics, I'm finding this work to be quite fascinating, in part because my colleague continually shows me how bridges themselves have the design principles and the design and the computations embedded in them in a way that can actually be seen in the artifact. I'm used to working with uh, sources or with materials where much of the work is focused on technologies that try to make invisible things visible. Things like oscilloscopes and schematic drawings help us to understand electronics. In the case of bridge images, more of it is there to be seen in the image itself and we hope to be able to use machine vision and image processing techniques to really bring out that aspect of these particular sources. So that's a sketch of some of the projects where I've used Mathematica, but let me step back to provide a wider perspective. A doctoral student in the humanities typically undergoes what are called comprehensive exams or qualifying exams, where they're expected to demonstrate their mastery of hundreds of books. And using Mathematica, I've been working on a workflows that can scale up that process by at least say an order of magnitude. So it's an expectation in humanities that using traditional techniques, people would routinely work with literature on the order of hundreds of books. But the question becomes if we augment those people computationally, if we make them cyborg humanists, as it were, how can they quickly establish familiarity with a literature that's on the order of, say, five to 10,000 books or the equivalent? And I'm going to turn to some of the techniques that I use and teach toward that end. Any source that contains links to other sources can be crawled. The canonical example, of course, is web crawling. And in fact, I love to show colleagues who know how to program the one line web crawler from the Mathematica documentation, just to give them a sense of some of the things that the, the language can do with its very high level commands. Now, in this case, what I'm showing is a crawl of very limited crawl of the WorldCat Identities API. This is a two-hop crawl of related records around the mid-20th century author Walter Lippmann. The Identities site gives access to about 20 million records, met metadata, for persons, institutions, fictional characters, and things like that that are mentioned in public, pub, published sources or that published sources are about. Now, of course, Mathematica also provides a very rich collection of tools for categorizing nodes or characterizing nodes, vertices, networks. So we can use all of those tools on anything that we crawl. And we can also resolve entities like Walter Lippmann himself to, enti to entities in Mathematica's entity framework. And we can resolve them to entities in sources of linked open data like Wikidata. And this provides us a tremendous access to still more computable knowledge. When we have texts, which we've gathered by crawling or other means, we can, can make connections between those texts and we can make things in those texts findable by way of indexing. In this slide, I'm showing an example of a method called rake, rapid automatic keyword extraction and I'm using it on the Wikipedia article for information overload. Now, Rake is an excellent way to extract phrasal keywords, particularly in shorter texts like abstracts and summaries. And if we combine it with more traditional methods, some of which Mathematica is now implementing, like TF-IDF, we have a good way of assessing the relevance of a particular text to a particular query. 
And we also have a good way of measuring the similarity between pairs of texts. If we combine this with entity recognition, especially in the form of Mathematica's pretty amazing text contents command and its relatives, we can link keywords that we find that we extract either through TF-IDF or through Rake to entities. We can also use keywords as a very useful form for discovery. So I find, since I often work with large collections of sources that have been kind of curated by me intentionally, I find I'll often have a question, a research question, and the answer is actually in my sources and the keywords lead me to the location of, of what I'm looking for. I've often already collected the answer to questions that I'm just coming up with. Mathematica now, as of more recent versions, has a large and growing collection of methods to do unsupervised clustering of texts, which can be very useful. But it's sometimes also interesting to be able to code your own. And again, this is typically just the work of a, a day or an afternoon to get up and running. This particular slide shows a compression clustering al algorithm that was developed by Rudy Silabresi and Paul Vitanyi. It's based on Kolmogra of complexity, but in a form that can be implemented uh, on a computer. And it is used here on the biographies of various people who were important in early Canadian history. And it shows us relationships between those people. If you uh, know these people or these town, you'll this time you'll recognize some of these people in the relationships. Now I often use quick clustering algorithms like this one for discovery while I'm writing. So I can write a paragraph about something and then I can use a clustering algorithm to cluster the paragraph that I've just written with all of my sources. And the sources that best match that paragraph are typically the ones that I want to cite if I haven't cited them already. For this kind of application, if you're clustering your own writing with your source base to look for more ideas, more linkages that you hadn't perhaps thought of, or more references that are useful for you, it makes sense to burst your documents into smaller units. And again, it's the matter of a line or two of code in Mathematica to burst a document into paragraphs or pages or 250 or 500 word text blocks or whatever is useful for your application. One fast technique for mining things like terminology or for getting a sense of the semantic uh, characteristics of your texts is the random indexing method of Magnus Solgren and his colleagues. Now, like a number of useful methods, this one creates vectors of co-occurrence events that occur in a context window around a particular word. It's based on random vectors, which means that the dimensionality of the space never increases. So this is very fast and it scales well to really large text collections. And again, it's easy enough to implement in a page or two of code. The example here shows left and right contexts of two words in Alice in Wonderland, said and replied. And what it shows us is that uh, Alice, uh, uh, Lewis Carroll preferred to use the phrase said Alice instead of Alice said, but he preferred to write Alice replied instead of replied Alice. So by looking at the left context of replied and the right context of said, we can see that those terms are the ones that are most likely to be found in front of or behind those particular verbs. Now random indexing can also be used to find words that pattern together. So we find in Alice in Wonderland that in the places where we find the word Alice, we would also find in similar environments, we also find words like king, caterpillar, pigeon, and so on. Solgren and his colleagues show how to use random indexing to measure the semantic density of words. They show how to use this technique to study semantic evolution over time and how to monitor ongoing discourse for, for anomalies. Many problems in text mining boil down to the ability to approximate the similarity between two documents of whatever sizes without entailing the costs of actually doing all pairwise comparisons in a large text collection. So if you have you know, millions of pages, you have very many more, of course, possible pairwise comparisons. You don't want to have to compute those all in order to do useful measurements. Ben Schmidt's method of stable random projection is very useful here. He worked with the Hathi Trust Digital Library, which has about 13.6 million books that are available to researchers, not as text, but in the form of a bag of words representation. 
And using a sketching algorithm called stable random projection, Ben shows that it's possible to store distinctive information for each book, each of those 13.6 million books, in about two and a half kilobytes each. So this is about a 50-fold reduction in storage space from the bag of words representation, which of course itself is a reduction in storage space from the actual text. Ben plotted these. He did a dimension reduction technique where he plotted all of these books in a two-dimensional space, and he shows that they cluster naturally on a wide number, on a number of different scales. So at the largest tech, uh, scale, texts cluster by language. Within a natural language, the next level of clustering is by subject, and then by genre, and then by date or style, and then by authorship, and finally by individual works. And I've extracted a small uh, portion of one of the figures from his paper here to show that kind of zooming in effect where you can zoom in to a particular genre like poetry, to a particular time like the 1800s, to a particular author like Sir Walter Scott, then to individual works. And we see that clustering repeated at every level. Now I find this technique to be really incredible. Schmidt doesn't have access to the full text of these 13 million some books. For each book, he only has a list of words and the frequency of each word. But using the sketching algorithm, which is fast and easy to compute, again, it's just a few pages of Mathematica code, it creates very small representations, he's able to encode a space, or he's able to create a space of sketches that encodes similarities and differences of more than 13 million books. And these similarities and differences are meaningful to us as humanists, as humans, at multiple scales, and yet the technique doesn't require the work of human classification at all. Mathematica makes it possible for one person to plausibly develop sophisticated computational analytics at the same time as making use of traditional research methods like close reading and scholarship, hermeneutic scholarship of all kinds. In my teaching, I introduce many of these methods to undergraduate and graduate students in the humanities and social sciences, and I use an open source, open content, and open access textbook that I developed, and now it has about 100 some odd screencasts to go with it. Unlike science or engineering classes, most of the students have little or no physical, uh, little or no technical background. Once in a graduate class, at, I think it was the first day of class, and I only I learned this lesson quickly. But once in a graduate class, I used the word integer on the first day of class, and one of the students said, "I hate math words," and all of the other students agreed with them. And so I, I had to kind of rethink how I was going to teach these students this kind of material. On the plus side, I've found most of my students have no preconceived notions about how difficult or how easy something should be. So I can introduce concepts and code based on the usefulness, the utility, rather than based on the difficulty. And that's one of the things that Mathematica makes very easy. In conclusion, let me say a few words about why Mathematica is a perfect choice for programming humanists. The fact that many of the commands are very high level makes it possible for a single programmer to accomplish a lot quickly with a few lines of code. And this makes it less intimidating for students too. When teaching, I focus on the skills of reading code. I encourage students to copy and modify expressions to see how they work. Mathematica's phenomenal documentation is a great resource for this. The fact that the language is holistic and inclusive also supports humanistic inquiry, which tends to prefer interpretations to be holistic. And this is buttressed in the language by extensive access to computable knowledge, both in the form of the built-in entity framework and the new modes of access to linked open data. Notebooks allow for literate programming. Typically, even when I'm working by myself, I'm writing as much prose in a notebook as I am code when I'm working on something. And the literacy of the notebooks facilitates communication with students and with colleagues. The notebook also provides a computationally enhanced view into a world of sources, which is how many humanists are used to thinking of their work. The notebook becomes a space that has similar properties to libraries, archives, museums, and other cultural heritage institutions that humanists often work in. And notebooks support a kind of a pair programming approach to interaction between colleagues, whatever their level of skill. I've been programming at this point for more than 40 years. 
daily often. And one of the things that I like most about working in Mathematica is that I'm still learn learning new things about the language and I'm learning new things with the language every single day. Thank you. I'm here. Um, happy to answer questions if anybody has anyone. Welcome. Before I started teaching with Zoom, I probably would have found it disconcerting to be confronted with a bunch of uh, blank rectangles with people's names on them. But now this is kind of my, this is my life these days. Bob Knockbar here. I used some of the your, uh, code from your first edition uh, when I was doing some text analysis of novels, oh, cool. trying to pull out character relationships. It helped me get into the text, um, but I ended up having to write a lot of rules to, to parse the text to find the conversations, because that's what I was interested in. Just finding the conversations was a real challenge, um, and then finding, you know, and then determining who was the, the speaker, um, oftentimes you could find that because it was, for example, like Alice said, but you also had to deal with she said or he said, um, or dialogues that went back and forth without uh, speakers being mentioned uh, explicitly. Um, do you know of any tools that are available that would make that sort of uh, mining easier? To, uh, I, to process the text? I have not, I mean, I have not looked at it. I haven't looked specifically at that. You're, you're certainly right that things like embedded, um, embedded dialogue could be a bit of a trick. And because the sort of better the writing, the less he said, she said, he said, she said is in there, the harder, the kind of the harder it is to understand in some sense. One, um, one thing that occurs to me is that, uh, the character dialogue probably has different properties than the, than the surrounding text, just in terms of things like patterns of verbs and uh, sort of pronoun use, especially like I, 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 as if the book is written in the second person, a first person singular pronoun would be a kind of a good clue that you're probably looking at a dialogue rich section of the page. I mean, with, the, with, with Mathematica's new neural net capabilities, it's so easy now to train learners to do things like that, like to look at a page and, and you could even just kind of highlight portions of it and say, this is an example of, of narration, this is an example of dialogue. And you, know, you could train it up on a tiny amount of labeled pages and then see how well it does on the unlabeled ones. Uh, that's a good idea about pronouns and stuff. I was relying mostly on syntax uh, quotations. Yeah. But uh, even with modern texts where the author writes with the text processor and the, the publisher then produces it, uh, you will still find errors. Yep. And, you know, one dropped quotation <laughs> messes up everything downstream. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and trying to go in and clean that up. Uh, so that the uh, data extraction would continue to work was a real challenge. I do find that the that Mathematica's new high-level text commands, like text words and text sentences and text contents, yep. those are those are pretty sweet for for doing things that even a couple of versions ago would have been quite hard to accomplish. So it might be worth yep. checking into some of those uh, and see if you can find ways to improve. Because there's also there's also things like the um, kind of sentiment detection type things or the Facebook mm -hmm. classifiers, and there's all kinds of fun stuff in there. Yes, I was using sentence structure to find the speakers. Nice. In particular. Yeah. Yeah, and I've talked with Jerome uh, uh, Lurador, who's who does a lot of the NLP neural network uh, about some of these things. Oh, cool. Yep. Well, don't let me hog the conversation. Somebody else speak up. We have until 10 past four central time. Uh, so if we have any more questions, now is the time to do it. I'm also happy to kind of meet with people or do a Zoom bef during or after the conference if people have other things they want to chat about. 
Well, for those of us uh, who've been involved with Mathematica for three decades, uh, but are now retired, interests in, in, in your area of expertise, um, the question arises, and I've, I've done some work in, uh, in journalism with this stuff and uh, in editing with this stuff, and it's been extraordinarily powerful. As you say, yeah. high-level commands are very powerful. But um, connecting with people at sort of a, an, an academic level or a local level, I'm here in Sacramento, is virtually impossible. You can, your network is made up primarily of academicians, I assume. Um, I can't seem to find um, a broader scope of folks who I think would be interested in this stuff um, outside of the university level. I don't know how to, uh, there's incredible power here, but it's uh, how to make it meaningful in a world where people are clearly focused on other matters at the moment yeah. um, is, uh, is difficult. Perhaps making it pertinent to the, the current conversations would be pertinent would be of value. But again, I don't know how to, uh, I don't know how to do it. There's no LinkedIn for this type of, of problem. Yeah, I see that Amy uh, suggested in the chat that meetups are a great way to connect with um, people who are interested in this kind of thing. I was also going to say that um, I've been kind of, I've drawn a lot of inspiration and, and ideas from people who call themselves computational journalists or data journalists. Um, they, as far as I know, they don't necessarily work in Mathematica, a lot of them work in R or other languages like that. But but if you can if you can bond over the the, the task, then perhaps um, the, the the language is then something that can be negotiated. Yeah, I found a lot of I found a number of people uh, who were working in R um, and uh, uh, which is fine because obviously uh, Mathematica can wrap around R. Exactly. Um, yeah. uh, but I, I find it a small community, and they, they don't. Maybe it's maybe it's too modern. <laughs> you know, it's not uh, it's maybe a hundred years behind before its time or something. Anyhow, our artifacts um, from the future, as Stephen was saying at his various uh, various talks. <laughs> really. Uh, well, but in terms, do you find an audience outside of, of your your student body, and I mean, uh, or a way of of, of expanding uh, the value? This stuff has value. The question is, where's the audience? Uh, other than seventeen folks in your seminar, who, who, you know, where are they? Yeah, my my uh, strategy is usually just to put stuff up as as kind of open access and and hope that people will find a path to it if it's the kind of thing that they're interested in. Mm. So where do you post that? Oh, uh, sorry, I I put stuff up on my own website. I put it up on GitHub and I post it to places like the Wolfram forums because I know that at least the people who are looking there are interested in Mathematica or or the Wolfram language or are already using it. Have you had any interaction with the historical societies, the various? Uh, um, I would say there, there, are, there are a number of people who call themselves digital historians, but that, that's a fairly, or digital humanists more generally, but that's a fairly small still proportion of, um, of the people who in, in, the, in my field per se. I see that Amy has her hand up, and I, I would say that she is also a digital humanist, so maybe she has a, a different per perspective on this. Hi. Hello. Hey, Amy. Hey. Um, thank you. That was really fascinating, and thank you for speaking up for the humanities. I'm wondering if it, the working in the way that you do, if it has enabled you to um, build any significant bridges to connect with um, people in other disciplines 
at where you might not have been able to do that or um, or maybe you've been able to um, help students see those connections between disciplines, just that we work in such um, separate silos so often. It's true. Yeah, actually, the, I do teach the digital research methods as a course. And um, this, I mean, for the past couple of years, many of the students have been drawn from a kind of across the university. And that was true also when I was teaching the intro digital humanities programming course. I used Mathematica for that for a couple of years, and the students were coming from all over the place. I find that... Um, I, I certainly enjoy inter like interdisciplinary work with people in other fields and disciplines uh, in terms of like usually what gets in the way at, at the university level is often the kind of reward structures that are and the disciplinary boundaries which are often policed by people who say they're interested in interdisciplinary work but actually go out of their way to penalize it in various ways but that's just, I mean, I'm not going to let it get me down, that's for sure. <laughs> but as I say, happy to, I'm happy to continue the conversation either in, uh, either in kind of during the conference through little Zoom chats or, or afterwards, just send me an email or, or contact me somehow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Enjoy you very it much. very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much.